Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'm going to share my presentation with everyone because introductions are going to be in the presentation. So this is Business Law 101 Part 1, Formation of the Business. And we have a story. All the words are staged, so let's see who are our players. We have Martha Stewardess. She is a graduate student at the Polytechnical College um, in San Francisco. She studies chemistry. She's expected to graduate with a doctorate in 2023. Her favorite movie is Sideways. Her favorite wine is Domaine Lubijac Pinot Noir from the Willamette Valley. And uh, her hobby is winemaking. We also have Brittany Spearstein, her best friend also a graduate student at the Polytechnical College in San Francisco studying computer science and business. Expected to graduate with the double masters in business and in computer science in 2022. Her favorite movie is also Sideways, that's why they are best friends. And their, her favorite wine is a Louis Bouillot Pearl de Vigne Bru. It's a sparkling wine. Her hobby is cooking and pairing her recipes with wine. And we have Myra Estefan. She's also a graduate student at the Polytechnical College in San Francisco studying electrical engineering. Her MA is expected in 2022. Her favorite movie, Surprise, Sideways. And her favorite wine is Mascota Vineyards Unanime Malbec 2017. She prefers um, Latin American wines. She studies to be a sommelier one day, specializing in Latin American wines. And here is their story. Brittany, take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. So I thought I would start off just before I get into the story. My favorite wine quote, which is the secret to enjoying a good wine. Step one is to open the bottle to allow it to breathe. Step two, if it doesn't look like it's breathing, give it mouth to mouth. Because I can't see any of you, I'm going to assume that you're hysterically laughing. Here's the story. Marta came up with an idea for refining the winemaking process by building a device that would continuously monitor certain key chemicals during the process and use sophisticated software algorithms to determine exactly what quantities of which ingredients to add at what times during the process to achieve the optimum balanced wine. Brittany worked with Marta to refine the algorithms and develop the software code for the device. Myra came up with a hardware design for the device, which is a chemical sensing probe inserted into the winemaking vat, attached to a computer input and readout device, and built a crude prototype of the device in the school's engineering lab, which Brittany programmed. Marta then tested on her next batch of home-brewed wine and surprisingly found out that it was delicious. Thank you. So the trio dubbed their device Sideways Winemaker and began holding dorm parties featuring their Sideways wine made using the Sideways, wine, sideways Winemaker. Marta even, or Myra even designed a cute little label for the Sideways wine bottles shown here with the letters uh, SIY written on it for Sideways wine. Brittany created a little web page where she described the delicious taste of sideways wine created using their sideways winemaker. Because of how delicious the wine tasted, word soon got around and other amateur winemakers started asking questions about the winemaker and if they could buy one. Brittany and Marta were super excited about the prospect of setting up a business to manufacture and sell their sideways winemaker. But as we all know from our law school fact patterns, uh, changes were brewing under the surface. Myra was actually graduating and had a nice job offer in New York that she wanted to uh, pursue. And so she wished Brittany and Marta good luck in their new venture and head off. So Brittany and Marta luckily were able to scrap together some funds of their own and they received a very nice $20,000 infusion from uh, Brittany's parents, which is not based on real life. My parents would not do that uh, to start up their business. Brittany and Marta now have come to you for advice to help them start up the sideways winemaker business. And here are the lawyers we are going to talk to. 
Now, of course, in real life, it's very expensive to talk to three lawyers of this caliber at the same time, but let's just suspend this brief for this one hour session. <clears throat> the first is Susan Morgan, who is the principal of Morgan Legal Services and is on the business law section board. Susan has over 20 years of experience in managing and counseling technology businesses and private companies. Susan was the co-founder and CEO of SoftView, the company that produced Macintax, the income tax program for the Macintosh, which was then acquired by Chipsoft and then into it, and which is now TurboTax. If you didn't know this, I, I fell in love with Susan after reading this because I love TurboTax so much. The indomitable David Pearson is a partner at Brother Smith LLP, and he is also a gentleman and a scholar. David has decades of experience representing closely held businesses and their owners. David works with clients to resolve general business issues, whether it involves drafting, negotiating, general business advice, or litigation. He handles general corporate matters, formation, dissolution, contract drafting, and contract review, merger and acquisition transactions, and litigates numerous general civil litigation matters very successfully. David is on the governing board of the CCCBA as a director. And the fantastic Lori Dannon is the principal of her own law office, law office of Lori Dannon. She practices transactional business and commercial real estate law because like it's not hard at all. Lori's business practice includes entity formation, structuring, negotiating, preparing various types of contracts <clears throat> for the operation of privately held businesses, mergers and acquisitions and dissolutions. Larry, Lori often acts as general counsel to her business clients. Lori's commercial real estate practice includes leasing, entity formation for rental and investment properties, and the purchase or sale of real property, whether it's de developed or undeveloped. Lori also acts as a neutral in mediation matters, including business owner disputes, breach of contract, and real estate matters, and is an all around fun gal. So now we are in the meeting with these three lawyers and we have a lot of questions. I'm going to stop the share and hopefully you all see us. Well, we are so happy to be able to talk to uh, you all about the business that we are trying to start. So the first question is Brittany's father um, insisted that we talk to a lawyer about incorporation because he said he got sued once and that was the lesson he learned. We don't understand why being sued has anything to do with starting a business. So please tell us why is that so important? Uh, Susan, why don't you take it away? Well, um, oh, oh, it was David, I think. Sorry, David, David why don't you take it away? <laughs> Either one of us could take it away, but mm -hmm. thank you either way. So <clears throat> thank you for coming to visit the three of us. And you actually made the first wise decision in coming to see us before you started your business and went off into the world so that we can help prevent you from getting sued. Uh, incorporating isn't necessarily going to stop any litigation, but potentially it could protect you in the future. As startup business women, you will end up personally guaranteeing everything initially. So that means you will be personally liable despite the fact that you may have a corporation or a limited liability company or some other entity to try and protect you. But eventually having that entity will provide you some personal protection. <clears throat> and the main issue you wanna do is get a good insurance broker they're going to provide you much more protection than the three of us as attorneys. So we would wanna work hand in hand with you to make sure you have a good insurance broker and get insurance on everything that lets the two of you sleep well at night because that will be your first defense against litigation. As attorneys forming the entity will provide you kind of the second layer of defense. So hopefully that gives you a little, little idea, but yes, upfront, you will be personally liable in all likelihood for almost everything that you do and touch. Thank you. 
Okay, so another question is that we heard we can form something called an LLC. So is that the same thing as forming a corporation? That's a really good question. Um, so I'll talk a, a lot more in a minute about that, but I wanted to just kind of follow something that, that David started out by talking to about other advisors other than the panel, the three of us to help you. So he already mentioned an insurance broker is really helpful. The other person who I think is very strategic for any business to have on their team is a really good CPA. Because mm -hmm. everything that you do and every decision that you make, including your entity selection and formation, is going to have a tax impact. The tax impact oftentimes drives the structure of our entities and also some of our business decisions down the, down the road. Because you always want to try to um, eliminate or reduce your tax impact as much as possible. So let me go back then to your question. Um, the entity itself is what we're going to try to do, like David had started to say, is we're going to try to structure the entity so that we put like a bubble over your entity and the assets that are in it, they are the assets that then would come under fire if you got sued, okay? So we want to project all your other assets that are outside of the entity. So we want, by, by forming an entity structure, sort of put a little dome or a shield over this business to the extent possible. Um, another thing to, to keep in mind is it's not only important to set up and form the entity correctly, but you have to continue to maintain it correctly through its life. So that's another conversation that we go on to in a little bit. Uh, so to directly answer your question, can, um, can you set up an LLC? An LLC is an entity structure, okay? So it can and does have some of the same benefits as a corporation. Um, it has similar benefits as transferability of those ownership interests, whether it's shares or interests, and it has limitations on liability, which we just mentioned a minute ago. Where there's differences is taxation. So corporations are um, acknowledged by the federal government under the IRS code. LLCs are not viewed as corporations. They're actually formed under state laws. So uh, another part of our conversation down the road will be if you're ever going to be operating in a different state, because we'd have to, if you would want to be an LLC, we'd have to be looking at many different states, laws and rules related to those LLCs. The federal government views the LLC basically as a partnership for taxation. Um, there's an exception to the rule as most things in the, LL, in, in the Internal Revenue Code, but for the most part, they're viewed as partnerships. So yes, you could do an LLC for limitations on liability, or the transferability of interest, there's some benefits, but taxation would be a big issue. Another issue is when you look at your future planning. So are you going to bring in other investors? Do you need to get more debt? I mean, you're starting a wine business, there's going to be a lot of expenses for you. If you're going to bring in um, VCs or angel investors, they oftentimes are going to like a corporation structure more than an LLC structure. So you have to kind of look a little bit into your future of what you think, where you think you're going to go with the growth of this company. Um, and then of course you need to look as you grow for your employees. Do you wanna have stock options? So they're a little bit easier under a corporation structure than giving um, interest under an LLC. So hopefully there's a lot more to it as all things in law, it's, a, it's an analysis of, of pro and con and risk management, um, but that's a good overall view at this point. Um, and then we'll let you delve into some particulars as we find out more of what you wanna do with your business. Sorry. Okay, so I'm really concerned now about these corporate taxes. Um, I keep reading in the news that uh, there's been something done in 2017 about the corporate tax, but I don't really understand it. Neither do I have really a desire to learn much about it other than I don't want to pay more taxes. So uh, Susan, what would you tell me about how we can avoid paying more taxes than we would otherwise? Okay, well, first of all, Martin and Brittany, it's delightful to meet you. Congratulations on your invention. I can't wait to taste your sideways wine. 
Um, <laughs> it's good. It's good. It certainly sounds good. So following on what Lori said, which really dovetails right into this question, um, LLCs are what's known as flow through entities, as Lori said, taxes partnerships, which means that the entity doesn't pay taxes. Instead, the profits and losses are transferred down to the members and the members uh, put those or add those to their own individual profits and losses for taxes. Corporations come in two flavors. There is a C corporation and an S corporation. An S corporation is somewhat similar to an LLC in that it's also a flow through entity. The S corporation doesn't pay taxes at the entity level, but the profits and losses are distributed down to the shareholders and the shareholders then uh, add them to their own individual taxes. The difference is a C corporation. In a C corporation, the entity does pay taxes. So the problem in a sense, or one of the problems with a C corporation, or that you have to, at least one of the issues you have to be aware of, is that if the C corporation, which has to pay taxes on its profits, assuming you had profits, then distributes money down to the shareholders, the shareholders also pay taxes. Those are considered dividends. So that's where you get into this double tax. With a C corporation, if you are planning to distribute profits down to the shareholders, you're gonna pay double tax at the entity level and then again at the shareholder level. Not a very good result. So if you're starting off with expecting a lot of losses, let's say, because you know uh, this business sounds like it's gonna need capital, it's gonna spend a lot of money, it'll take time before it reaches profitability. With a flow through entity, like an LLC or an S Corp, the entity doesn't pay any money, but what's better is that these losses get passed down to the shareholders and the shareholders can then add them into their individual tax returns and that could be beneficial. It's easy to change from an S Corp to a C Corp. It's just a filing with the IRS. If you decide you wanna be an S Corp, you have to make that decision at the time you incorporate and you have, a, I think it's two and a half months in which to file with the IRS your what's known as S election. So you have a limited time to choose to be an S Corp, file it with the IRS, and then you're an S Corp. S Corps do have certain restrictions. If any of your shareholders are gonna be foreign people, you don't have an S Corp anymore because that's not allowed. If any of them are gonna be entities, no more S Corp. If you're going to um, have a different class of stock, like when your VCs wanna join, you lose your S Corp. That's not harmful, it just means that you switch at that point in time from an S to a C. So that's kind of an overview of the difference in tax consequences for the different entities. And following up with the tax question, ladies, where are you living and what state were you looking at forming the entity in, if any? Oh, we have no idea. I mean, we live here in California, okay. um, going to college in San Francisco, um, and I don't have any plans to move. I hope Brittany doesn't have any plans to move because I'd miss her. Um, well, Governor Newsom, thanks you for staying in the state and helping pay taxes for <laughs> us. <clears throat> so one of the issues to look at, in addition to selecting the type of entity, is where to form the entity. And we have a lot of clients that come to us and they've seen commercials on TV that say that Nevada is an awesome place to form an entity and they won't have to worry about taxes and they'll be able to do all kinds of good things. And Lori and Susan and I have to then convince them that that's not really a good idea, depending upon what type of business they have and what they're doing. The two primary states that we work with in forming our entities, because we are California attorneys, is either California or Delaware. And those are the two big states as far as our local residents are concerned. Delaware obviously has courts specific to corporate disputes. Uh, they have probably the most developed corporate law in the United States. And most of our publicly traded companies are located there because of those beneficial corporate rules and the, the courts. 
but smaller entities generally look at filing in the state where their owners reside, which would be here in California. Because if you were to file in another state outside of California, you would still have to register it here. And then you get to potentially pay taxes in multiple states without having any business there or, or any property there. So in general, we recommend that you file here in California unless there's some reason to go to a separate state. Uh, filing here is easy. Uh, with the pandemic, our Secretary of State has helped to streamline their website so we can do all of the filing from our offices right online and set up whichever entity you know, is best fit for your startup. Right here in California, you only have to pay California taxes, which unfortunately are high. And at some point in the future, the three of us may convince you to move to Nevada or Texas or a state that doesn't have a personal income tax to save yourself some money. Right. So suppose we decide to do a Delaware S Corp or a California S Corp. We have to, of course, discuss it among others, uh, among each other with Brittany. Um, how do we go about this, Lori? What is the next step to take? So the, the first thing, the uh, step in the formation process is the actual filing uh, step is to file an articles of incorporation or a certificate of incorporation. So depending on if it's in California, it's called articles of incorporation. If it's in Delaware, it's a certificate. It's basically the same type of document requesting the same type of information. But that is actually the document that actually when it's filed and accepted by the Secretary of State, that actually is the vehicle that forms the entity. But before you get there, you have to make some decisions and things that we have to talk about. Number one is the name. So you need to have a name that's a, a good name that hasn't been used, that's not in use already. So we have to do a little research. If you're going to be in California, we search um, the names in the Secretary of State. I used to search not only the corporate names, I always do a search on the LLC names too. Because one of the things you're trying to look for is to have a name that is distinct and different from somebody else's. So you might ask the question, well, what if um, a corporate, can a corporation and an LLC have the same name? Um, potentially, yes, but it is confusingly similar. And if somebody goes to sue you and they happen to name your corporation instead of an LLC with the same name, you still have to go into court and get rid of that lawsuit, which costs you money and you can't go to anybody to get attorney's fees back. You just have to pay that expense. So my view is always to tell clients, let's pick a name that hasn't been used before and let's pick a name that's distinctive from a, another entity. We don't just stop there. I usually look at fictitious business names. I also go to the USPTO website, which is the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I look to the trademark registrations because I want to make sure that somebody did not trademark the name. Why would I do that? Because you would spend all the money setting up uh, and forming an entity only for the first thing to do is you'd probably receive a cease and desist letter. And then you'd have to change your name. So it's better to do some planning and some research up front before you decide on that name. Um, there's a, and also the other thing is domain names because you want a website. So I always do one of those searches also. So you want to do a little work there. Um, you'll need to establish an address for the entity. So we'll need to know what the address is going to be, the principal place of business. You can have a mailing address that can be different also. The principal, your executive office can be a different address. Um, the next thing is an agent for service of process. So you can either have an individual be an agent or you can have a corporation. There are third party corporations that actually act as agents for service of process. Those names and those addresses are listed on the Secretary of State. So they're publicly accessible. So sometimes, you know, somebody might wanna start out not paying a fee to a corporate um, third party um, agent but then they have to realize that whatever address they're putting out there, if it's their home address, that's also a matter of public record. So I usually try to forewarn people about that. And once it's out there, 
in the public domain, it's out there. So you can pull up and search these articles or certificates of incorporation um, just by looking at the website. Um, and then you'd want to put also um, officer and director indemnification and liability limitation clauses um, in your articles. You don't actually have to, you can, you can take care of that and put that in your bylaws, um, but you can also put it in your articles. So just to wrap that up, the articles or the certificate of incorporation is the first document that you're preparing for filing. And when that document is filed and accepted by the California Secretary of State, that actually forms your entity. Um, and that just starts the ball rolling and you have a lot more documentation to do after that. And our office will that? happily represent you as an agent for service. And I prefer to be agent for all of my clients because I want to see that lawsuit. Uh, I've had clients that have used some of the corporate services and things sometimes get lost in the mail uh, mm -hmm. or they get lost in the shuffle. I've been served personally too many times on behalf of clients, always causes a bit of nervousness before I look at who is actually the defendant and it's not me, which is always a good thing. <laughs> but having that personal service on the attorney is a big plus. And I offer it as a free service. I don't charge my clients for being agent. So I wanna see that complaint so I can deal with it as soon as it gets served. Great. So this is a lot of information. Um, Susan, are we done yet? What, what else do we have to do? So we are a long ways from done. So I'm going to talk about the steps that any company would have to do. And then I want to talk a little bit about specific things that you have to do because of your particular situation. So let me uh, take a few minutes here. Um, so having <clears throat> formed the company and have your articles, the, the next charter document or key document you need is your bylaws, corporations, <clears throat> have to have bylaws <clears throat> and these will get drafted by your attorney and the bylaws will set forth these are not the bylaws are not public they are not publicly filed these are internal they're internal to you but they'll set forth all of the other uh, details about your uh, corporation they'll set forth how meetings are going to be conducted board meetings shareholder meetings the size of the board um officer responsibilities and a number of other types of things. Um, so those have to be um, uh, drafted and generally board approved. Um, then <clears throat> following the bylaws is what we call your organizational resolutions or minutes of first meeting. So um, corporations have certain formalities that they have to adhere to or they can lose the protection of a corporation. If, if you don't act like a corporation, then you may not get treated like a corporation and you may lose that limited liability protection, which is the whole point. So you do wanna to adhere to the corporate formalities. And one of them is you have to, your, your board has to be set up and follow certain formalities. Some things have to be approved either at meeting of the board or in lieu of a meeting by written consents that are properly handled. So boards have two ways to act, by a meeting or by written consent. And either way, there has to be a first meeting or organizational resolutions consents to set up the rest of the corporation. So that those minutes or resolutions will appoint the initial board members, generally by the incorporator. After that, board members are elected. Board members are elected by stockholders, but before you have stockholders, you have this initial step. Um, the officers are then appointed, um, your key officers, uh, which would include like CEO or president, a secretary, and somebody that's either a CFO or a treasurer, a financial officer. There may be others. You may have some VPs, you may have some technology officers, but at least those key th three officers. You generally will have to adopt banking resolutions because you're going to want to open up a bank account. And the bank is going to want to know that the board adopted resolutions saying who gets to sign, who gets to sign checks, who can spend the money. So you'll need some resolutions around that. Um, 
And then finally, you're gonna need to issue stock so that you become owners. The way you own the company is by issuing stock to yourselves. And you'll need the organizational resolutions to approve these issuances, determine how many shares you're each getting and approve those issuances. So that whole set of actions are a part of this organizational resolution or a first meeting that any company needs to do. Now, I wanna take a minute to also talk about a couple of issues that you need to deal with because of your particular situation. And they have to do with protecting your intellectual property. So you all developed your technology, your prototypes <clears throat> before you formed the corporation. So the two of you need to assign in everything you developed into the corporation. The corporation has to own the technology, otherwise it's not gonna have much value. No sense having an entity if it doesn't own the technology. Typically you'll assign it in in exchange for getting your stock. But you have a little problem. You have a third party who developed technology who's no longer here. You're gonna to need to have a talk with your friend and have her assign in everything she developed into the corporation. Whether you wanna give her a little bit of stock or not, that's a discussion you'll need to have, but that technology she owns needs to get assigned into the corporation. And your last little problem is that some of this technology you developed using school property. And universities have a way of wanting to assert rights to anything that's developed on their property. You'll need to have a chat with the university to see if they will assign in or waive any rights they may have in exchange perhaps for a little bit of stock or whatever. But those are conversations you're gonna need to have so that you end of the day, your corporation owns everything free and clear. The last thing you want is a cloud on title of ownership of your IP. So there's some issues to deal with here. Susan, what do you think about setting up two entities, one to hold the IP and one to actually be manufacturing to protect the IP further? That is a possibility. It's obviously a little more expensive and a little more complicated, depending upon how you intend to affect manufacturing. But that has been done, and that is something to consider. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I am... Uh, a little ver clamped here, thinking about all these uh, all these permutations of choices. But um, see, Brittany and I, we have been like best friends since high school, and then we basically went to the same school just so that we can, you know, continue studying together. And it would be really awkward to hold these meetings and write minutes and all that jazz. So how can we like avoid that? David, do you have some ideas for us about this? Uh, there is a thing in California called a close corporation that lets you omit doing a lot of the corporate formalities. Uh, I don't really like them. I know a lot of attorneys don't like them because if you omit too many corporate formalities, it makes it easier for a judge to decide that you aren't really a corporation and you are personally liable. So I tend to shy away from them, but really it's, it's simple to follow the corporate formalities. You just need to have one meeting a year with the shareholders and one with the directors that you document. You don't have to document every single meeting. You just have to have that one meeting a year that you document. Uh, and unfortunately, too many clients don't do that. And 10 years down the road, when you go to sell your company you are creating 10 years worth of meeting minutes, but our firm sends out reminders every year for you to go and hold your meeting. And we offer to document that for you just to keep track of it. And, and we if, highly recommend that you do that. <laughs> and if I may add into what David is saying, um, corporations can use written consents in lieu of a meeting. So you can, if you don't wanna, if you have things you need to do, but you don't wanna have meetings, is just have a written consent, which the attorneys can write up for you they write up what you're agreeing to and approving, and then you just sign it. Um, and that's a really simple way to get business done within the 
the confines of the corporate code and not have to worry about a lot of meetings. I agree with both, both David and Susan. And you can set up te templates. We do that in our office all the time, especially when you're first starting out, you kind of repeat the same kind of um, actions that need to be authorized. And so you basically can have templates set up for those meeting minutes that kind of guide you through almost like a fill in the blank at the beginning. And I think they become more critical as you get larger and, and you have more people involved, but that's also, also something else that you can consider. So how do we keep control of the company if we keep giving our shares you know, to, to here and there? Okay, um, that's a really interesting question because at, at some point you may not keep control of the company, but certainly in the beginning, um, you want to keep control. So first of all, you want to, depending upon where you're setting up your corporation um, in California, if you authorize a large number of shares, there's no penalty. Not all states are that way. Some states authorizing a large number of shares is a penalty, but not in California. If you authorize a, a large number of shares, you can start off by giving yourselves a reasonable number of shares. Um, I'll, I'll typically use around a million shares that I issue to each founder. And the reason for that is so Here's that- to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, <clears throat> Uh, the ownership is the same whether you got 10 shares each, you're 50 50 owners, or 100 shares each, you're 50 50 owners, or a million shares each. But when you want to go down the line to, let's say, offer stock options to employees, you're going to want to offer them a much smaller percent of the company. And by starting off with a reasonable number of shares for yourself, when you're going to offer them a much smaller amount, it's still ends up being what looks like a number of reasonable number of shares that you're offering them without going into fractional shares, which you never want to do. Um, so you want to be careful about how you, what offers you're making, um, how you're deciding what is, what should a CEO get in a stock option. You also want to be careful about how you're dealing with financing. So you have, um, $20,000 that's been given to you that presumably could be construed as a debt. Maybe when you have enough money, you pay that back with an interest. That's one way to, to stay away from equity. Another way to construe it is what's known as a convertible promissory note, convertible debt. It's kind of a hybrid, which means it's debt until you do a financing round, usually with a VC later on down the line. And the reason for that is if you wait till later on down the line, your company's worth a lot more because you will have done a lot of great things to make the value of your company higher. So that debt converts to equity at a much higher valuation. In the beginning, if you try to sell equity, your valuation is not that high. You're going to give away too much of your company. So try to construe your original financings as convertible notes, there's another instrument called a SAFE, which is a simple agreement for future equity, similar to a convertible note, only without um, interest, that converts later on. The whole point is you're avoiding setting a valuation <clears throat> early on and waiting to set the valuation later on when you're worth a whole lot more, so you give away less equity. These are all things that will help you to hold on to your equity and hold on to your value. I know since I deal with a lot of non-tech companies, I always try and talk my clients out of making their employees shareholders. It never tends to end well in the tech business here in the Bay Area. Everybody wants to be an owner and they hear about how their company is going to go public and they'll become millionaires. Most companies don't end up that way. And with a business like yours, that's primarily manufacturing and not necessarily high tech, you don't really want to encourage those employees to become shareholders because then they get to look at your books and records and you have heightened duties to them that you wouldn't otherwise have. So 
We can do other things to make it seem like they have ownership beneficial interests, but without giving them actual stock and having ownership. So when we get to that point where you all are looking at having additional owners, the three of us will sit down and talk to you and try and talk you out of some of that. So we have, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, David is right. Other structures like bonuses, for example, uh, work very well in, in the sort of companies, manufacturing companies and so forth. Um, and other kinds of structures based on revenue that come in that are bonus related and that keeps you away from equity. And that's certainly true. So the question is, we have this $20,000 and your suggestion is to actually issue a note for it so that I don't understand. They said it was a gift. If he wants it to be a gift and and have nothing in return, um, that's wonderful. <laughs> but most of your people that are going to invest in your companies aren't going to invest that way. So if not this particular uh, infusion, there will be other infusions you will need. Twenty thousand is probably not enough to get you to cash flow positive. It's enough to get you to a few places where you'll need to go out to the community to raise more funding. So at some point, you'll have to look at the structures for doing that. Right. And that's why you suggested that if we need financing for our manufacturing process, then maybe a corporation is a better idea than an LLC. Maybe, maybe not. It also depends on how you go about getting the financing because a lot of startup people go to the SBA. You go to a bank and you apply for an SBA backed loan. And that, that's what they are there for is to help people start out their businesses and get that initial funding. So it doesn't matter at that point what type of entity you are with the SBA because you will be personally guaranteeing it, taking out life insurance and lots of good things. Right, but right. will it's, it's, that SBA loan be enough? <clears throat> that depends on your business plan. The three of us would have to see if you've got your business plan set up and what, what you're looking at spending. And obviously you would want to have, as Lori said, an excellent CPA to start doing a cash flow analysis and helping you decide what your what's called a burn rate, how much cash you're going to burn before you start becoming cash flow positive to determine how much money you actually need to get this off the ground. All right, yeah. Suzanne. To, to the extent you wanna raise larger sums of money, SBA loans will go so far, only so far. To the extent you're really looking at venture capital sums of money that could be in the millions. Manufacturing is a cost intensive initially uh, business. If you're looking at going to venture capital community, whether it's angel investors or institutional VCs, that's where this issue of corporation versus LLC tends to come in. If that's not part of your business plan and you're looking at alternative means, um, and again, David's absolutely right. You have to figure out what your plan is and how you're gonna get from step to step to step. Um, and Cause that will dictate what you wanna do. Um, so if you're not looking at venture capital, then corporation versus LLC, LLC may or may not make more sense for you. But if you're going out to the venture capital community, they like corporations. And they like corporations because they like stock. They understand stock. Uh, typically, they're going to want uh, preferred stock, which has all kinds of attributes. You can set this sort of thing up in an LLC, but it's harder. Uh, corporations are more uh, set up to handle this sort of thing. Um, sometimes the venture capital community will want you to be a Delaware corporation. They like Delaware. Delaware has very uh, well-known laws that venture capital understand and, and everyone understands. The judiciary is well-trained in corporate law and in particularly laws surrounding venture capital. Um, which means that if you went that route, and even as if you started as a California corporation, you might have to reincorporate in Delaware later. That's doable, costs a little money, but it's doable. 
Um, so it's a very, very different picture if your plan is to go the venture capital route than if your plan is to sort of bootstrap and, and go banks and debts and so forth. It's like a two different paths. And just another quick um, note there too. You know, just to let you know that planning is key and you know, it's good to have a, a plan to go by, but plans do change depending on um, different influences. So even if you would decide to start out with an LLC, you can always convert to a corporation later. So, you know, it's not that you're set in, into one entity structure and you can never get out. It does cost money um, and, and there are different hoops to go through to do that, but it is possible and it happens a lot actually. So I just wanted to add that little tidbit in. Mike Tyson's famous quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> Well, we see one question. Um, suppose uh, Brittany and I are sisters and we want to set up a family business. Um, what is your suggestion to avoid the, fo the fo corporate formality specifically for a family business? I think you touched on this, but maybe can go into a little bit more detail. I think probably all of us can, can answer that one. And and David already answered it a little bit when he said that if it's a corporation um, in California, you can choose a closed corporation. And, and I, I align with David too. I, I don't do them very often, but the um, formalities are a bit relaxed there. As far as between corporations and LLCs, LLC formalities are a bit relaxed. Um, however, um, that's required formalities are a bit relaxed. I tend to tell my clients and advise my clients to run LLCs, formalities, and corporations on the same level because I'm trying to build bricks and build a shield around that entity and protect it as much as possible and the, to the extent that you can continuously build these bricks to protect the assets within the company and more specifically, you know, protect the assets outside of the company that are your personal assets, I think is better. So I run formalities about the same. I think somebody also asked about partnerships. Partnerships are not my favorite thing. They're not an entity. They don't provide a lot of the benefits that we've been talking about with the limitations of liability. They don't protect, they don't give you the easy transferability of those ownership interests. Um, so partnerships are something I typically steer my clients away from because they don't have the benefits that LLCs and corporations have. Susan and David, I'm sure you have other things to add there. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I look at for a family business or if there's a large number of family members is to set up an LLC, but make it what's called a manager managed LLC. Mm -hmm. So there's two different types of LLC. One is member managed where every owner has a say in how the business is run and others can be manager managed where you in effect appoint one or a few people to run the business for you. And that works very well with a family run business where you have one or two family members that are the managers and they make all of the day-to-day -day decisions and they only go back to the family in general if there's some type of a larger decision that would be set out in the operating agreement for the parties. And I see that really very frequently with property ownership where mom and dad have a ranch and they put it into the LLC. And a hundred years later, you've got 30 different owners because it's filtered through multiple levels. And having that LLC with a manager in it is much easier than any other form to try and deal with getting everybody's fifth cousin to vote on doing something. So one thing I would add to that too, and with a family business, um, I generally think an LLC does become a more attractive entity because in particular, if, and, and we see this with restaurants a lot, and, you know, which, which will form that way. If you're looking to have the business make money and you want the money to be able to come down to you, I mean, you don't want it sitting there in the, in the corporation or the entity coffers. You want to be able to distribute it down to those of you above and beyond salaries, but, but actually share in the profits. LLC can do that. And you don't have that problem with taxation we talked about. In a corporation, the 
other than salaries and so forth, which are paid to you, the corporation pretty much holds the, the funds, presumably using it to grow or, or, and so forth. And how do the shareholders ever cash out? Um, dividends are double tax. So that's, you know, distributing it down to the shareholders is not usually the way you want to go. In a corporation, the way or, the, or sort of the vision of how you cash out is the corporation gets acquired or it goes public. Those are the two roads. It goes public, everyone becomes a public stockholder, and that's rare. That is very rare. Or the corporation gets bought. It gets um, bought by a bigger company. And in that process, the stockholders then either get cashed out or they get stock in the bigger company, which may be public. So. Uh, the corporation's vision is that you're not sending money down to the shareholders, other than employees, but not, not shareholders, unless and until there's this exit. Whereas with the LLC, and what's nice about that for family business, is that every year you can, or whenever, you can distribute down to the shareholders, to you, the profits, and not get taxed on them. Uh, not So there's not that double tax. Um, distributions themselves don't get taxed, just the actual profits and losses. So for a family business, and we see this with small restaurants a lot of times and other similar businesses, um, LLCs may be a better vehicle and, and a simpler vehicle in a sense to, to suit those needs. I've got a good question from, <clears throat> from Ms. Falhadi about series LLCs and as far as I know, we still have not allowed them in California. A number of states have, and California treats each series as a separate LLC. So if you want them here, someone's gonna to have to go fight the legislature because the legislature in California still doesn't understand LLCs. So there's huge differences and some businesses you would never put in an LLC because of the differences the legislature has built into the entities that make them disfavored, like for contractors. Well, and to some extent, you know, California is still behind, I think, in, in the LLC land. Um, some some uh, businesses are precluded from being an LLC. So if you have a license under the BNP code, the Business and Professions Code, you're basically precluded from being an LLC. There are some exceptions, but um, that's the basic rule. So, Well, there is a question about a licensed professional, a lawyer. Uh, if you are a solo, you just started your practice, you have no employees, would it make sense to incorporate? Who wants to take this up? Talk to your CPA. Well, I can, I can say, I mean, if, if you're a solo- That was a punt. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're a solo and you, and you want to you know, form an entity around a law business, you would have to either be a LLP or a PC, in other words, a professional corporation. You don't get to incorporate the same way as our tech startups. Um, and that's a, a little bit different um, situation. Um, you don't have the professional liability shield. You still have to go out and get professional liability insurance. So um, operating as a PC or an LLP may make more sense only when you start having partners, um, but that's something to consider. I think the other thing there is it really, with the changes in the tax law just recently, uh, not in the not too distant um, past, uh, it really depends on what your revenues are too, if it's gonna be advantageous for you to be a professional corporation. So that's a CPA question. Um, I always say it's a CPA question before it's a legal question, although I do a lot of professional corporations and a lot of attorneys uh, I work with them. Uh, that's the first questions with the CPA and the tax. But can you be a solo and be an LLP? You don't really have a partner. No, you can't. So in that case, you could be a PC, but PC you could be a PC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could be a PC. And if your revenues are high enough, as Lori is alluding to, you may want to consider that. Um, and again, that's a good CPA question. Um, my apologies, my manufacturing director, my son was passing through here. Um, so um, we have a few more minutes for questions from the audience. Please type it into 
the chat. And uh, while you're doing that, I would like to let you know that this is an eight part series. We still are working to figure out what actually the next uh, few parts are, but the immediate coming up is actually next Tuesday at the same time. This is about equity uh, basics and uh, it's going to be similarly entertaining. I'm going to continue drink my imitation wine and uh, we are going to talk about uh, this fantastic wine business. In following uh, sessions, we will be talking about um, employing employees and how to do that, in, uh, holding and managing the IP and making sure you're not in trouble with that. Uh, any other liabilities that you could have issues spotted from this little fact pattern, they are going to come up in our future presentations. So a detailed schedule is coming your way. We are very excited to do this with you. I do not see any further questions and we are one minute to our time. So with that, I think I will thank you everybody for coming and this was very educational and also very entertaining. And I'm passing the baton back to you. Um, great, that was great. Um, I can't wait to see what kind of trouble everybody gets into. Um, <laughs> on, the, on the optimistic side, I can't wait to see how much money they make. Um, there we go. Um, <clears throat> did you guys get the question about if you are a lawyer who just started your practice? Yeah. Okay. And then um, did you mention that the next program is next week? Yes, I did. Okay, good. Next Tuesday. Next same Tuesday, time. perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, and thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see everybody next week. Oh, one more thing. I would like to invite everybody to the Business Law Section's M Series Spectacular presentation, which is about a brave new world. So we are going to talk about cryptos, NFTs, and social media. And I'm going to be a sober presenter there. <laughs> I'm going to be somewhat knowledgeable. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. And